Hello, it's Scott Manley here. Today I want to talk to you about a prolific spacecraft. The spacecraft which has been flown to space the most number of times. And it's probably not what you think it is. I mean, it's not the Space Shuttle. It's not the Soyuz. I mean, both of those designs have flown over 100 times, maybe even 200 times each. But this design has flown in space, landed and been recovered more than both the Space Shuttle and Soyuz combined. It hasn't carried people for most of those flights, although a closely related version did. Now, if you th guess that I'm talking about the Soviet Zenit spacecraft, then give yourself a space nerd point or whatever floats your boat. So yeah, the Zenit spacecraft was a prolific Soviet spy satellite, which flew from the 1960s right up until the 1990s, performing optical reconnaissance for the Soviet military. Now, don't confuse it with the similarly named Zenit rocket. These are two unrelated pieces of space hardware. Uh, and indeed, originally it went by a different name. When the Soviet government formally authorized the development of the first artificial satellite in 1956, the plan was to build Object D. It was D because the R-7 rocket already had warhead payloads that were codenamed A, B and V, and D was next on the list. So Object D would eventually become Sputnik 3. It was a bit too ambitious, uh, and when the launch vehicle was ready before the satellite, they quickly knocked together Sputnik 1, which became the first artificial satellite. But in addition to Object D, the order also authorised development of Object OD, and the O signified that it could orient itself, which is an important uh, you know, capability for a spacecraft designed to take photographs of things. Now, over the next few years, this evolved and got larger as the capabilities were better understood. But simultaneously, there was a bit of conflict over the Soviet space program and what it should be doing. Khrushchev saw the propaganda and prestige potential of flying humans in space. However, more uh, grounded scientists thought that they should focus on automated satellites. And the military, they really just wanted to exploit the high ground of space. And in the middle of all this, Sergei Korolev managed to get support for building a spacecraft with a pressurized return capsule which could carry a human or scientific payload or a set of cameras for observing the Earth. This is what would become Vostok and Zenit and a few other satellites using the same design. So they now had Object K, K for Corable or Craft. That would be designated in such a way that there were four like blocks, right? Number of, block one would be the prototypes that would prove the technology. Block two was the sort of reconnaissance satellites. Three was the human spaceflight project. And fourth was a, a higher uh, resolution reconnaissance satellite. And, and while the projects would in theory happen in parallel, it was understood that priority was in placing a human in space before the US so that they could milk that prestige for all, all it was worth. The test flights began in May of 1960 with a vehicle which had no heat shield because they were sort of concerned that a failure in the guidance system could result in the descent module landing, well, anywhere on the Earth. And this concern proved to be prescient as the guidance system did indeed malfunction and instead of performing a deorbit burn, it accidentally boosted the spacecraft into a higher orbit. But other than this mishap, it did succeed in sufficiently proving the rest of the spacecraft systems so much that they were willing to fly biological payloads on future flights, i.e. they put dogs on the future flights. That spacecraft, by the way, it would eventually deorbit a couple of years later in 1962, breaking up over the US. And a notable piece of debris landed in a town in Wisconsin where it was initially ignored as trash until local authorities figured out that it was part of a Soviet spacecraft. And that piece was sent to the Smithsonian and ultimately back to the Soviet Union. But replicas were made and they're apparently in the local museums. And there's like a plaque and a brass ring embedded in the road and even a Sputnik fest every year, which is described as a wacky tacky out of this world celebration of the crash of a Soviet Sputnik. Their, their words, not mine. Anyhow, the rest of the development continued with increasing levels of success until the flight of Vostok 1 with Yuri Gagarin in 1961. And after achieving this most prestigious event, Khrushchev let the secret spy satellite development really get started on its test flights. 
At some point in the intervening time, the Zenit name had been attached to the spy satellite program, but the numbering system still originated on the shared program. So we had the Zenit 2 and the Zenit 4 variants, but no 3 because that was assigned to Vostok. Now the designs shared a great deal in common with a 2.3 meter spherical pressure module with a heat shield for re-entry and a biconic service module which would provide attitude control and other capabilities on orbit. The whole vehicle would mass about five tons. The Zenit pressure module would carry the cameras allowing them to operate in a pressurized controlled environment rather than say figuring out how to operate cameras in the vacuum of space. It obviously didn't need the full life support capabilities of the Vostok, but it did, it did need accurate temperature control to avoid problems like focal drift in the optics due to thermal expansion. While the configuration of the cameras could vary from one flight to the next depending upon mission requirements, the baseline configuration was four cameras with 1000 millimeter uh, focal length optics and a fifth with 200 millimeter focal length and that would provide a context for the four long focal length cameras. Each camera would have enough film for 1500 exposures. So the long focal length cameras would take images that were about 60 kilometers by 60 kilometers and give a ground resolution of about 10 to 15 meters depending upon the angle. Now, some of the early Zenit flights also carried the, the Baikal photo television device, which was an electro optical imaging system which could transmit TV images to the ground and enable much faster turnaround and reaction to activity in the target area. But this hardware disappeared from later flights, likely because the technology in the early 1960s was really not able to deliver the quality that was needed. The Zenit was equipped with much more sophisticated communications and control systems compared to the Vostok that would allow command sequences to be delivered securely when the spacecraft was passing over the USSR and then have those executed later in the day once the targets were carried under the spacecraft's orbit by the rotation of the Earth. Zenit 2 was also equipped with the KUST 12M electronic intelligence apparatus and while I'm not sure what the capabilities of this was, I imagine that it would primarily be able to identify things like communications and radar facilities uh, on, in the US. Finally, the vehicle was equipped with a self-destruct system which could activate if the deorbit occurred in the wrong place or if deorbit failed completely and left it stranded in orbit ensuring the military hardware would not fall into the hands of an adversary. So, the Zenit 2 launched in the same Vostok variant of the R7 rocket, equipped with the Block E third stage powered by the RD-0109 engine. It would be placed into a low Earth orbit for a week or two of operation before firing its retro thrusters and returning the capsule to the Earth for analysis of the film. And the first launch occurred in December of 1961. However, it never made it to orbit after the launch vehicle failed early on. The spacecraft would have landed somewhere in Siberia and triggered its self-destruct system, but apparently nobody's ever found it. The second launch in April of 1962 was a success and it reached orbit. And uh, being a secret mission, the USSR gave it the public designation of Cosmos 4. It was supposed to fly for four days, but it developed a problem with the orientation system and it returned a day early. The first fully successful flight was Cosmos 7 in July of 1962. This also carried a secondary payload. It was a set of experiments for radiation measurement. Indeed, many of the Zenit spacecraft would carry experiments alongside reconnaissance hardware. I would imagine that having the secondary experiments on board would offer some degree of cover for the true nature of these flights. So this would evolve into the Zenit 2M design, uh, also known as the Gector. This added a science module on the front of the vehicle, uh, the Nauka module, so, you know, basically the same name as the space station module. Uh, and this was a largely self-contained science module with its own power and communication capabilities, relying on the Zenit primarily for launch and stabilization on orbit. And it would be cast off and left in orbit to decay naturally when it came time for the Zenit to return to Earth. The Nauka hardware was occasionally used to carry extra batteries to extend the on-orbit life of the Zenit. 
So the baseline Zenit 2 flew for 74 times up until 1970. The 2M flew 92 times from 1968 to 1979. So in addition to these Earth reconnaissance satellites, there were a couple of scientific versions of this uh, design. So the Zenit 2M was evolved into the Bion satellite, and that meant instead of cameras, it would carry biological payloads in the pressurized module. Uh, it would actually carry monkeys at one point. Uh, the module out in front would be used to carry extra batteries to extend the mission. So the first Bion flight was in 1973. That flew 11 times up until 1996. And interestingly, Bion 3 in 1975 would carry a payload from the USA. This is the first time that US experiments would fly on a Soviet spacecraft, a spacecraft originally designed to spy on the USA. There's also the photon satellites, which were dedicated to research payloads. Because if you have a nice, stable imaging platform, that also works pretty well as a nice, stable platform for studying microgravity. It pretty much looked similar to the Bion or the Zenit 2M design, again with the battery module on the front, but without life support system and instead scientific experiments involving things like crystals and furnaces. So Photon began launching in 1985 and it launched as recently as 2007 with payloads from the European Space Agency. And there's also a new generation of Photon and Bion which still use the same spherical descent module, but they have a new service module with solar panels to enable orbit lifetimes of six months. So there was a test flight of Bion in 2013 and Photon in 2014, which that flight suffered technical problems. And the next Bion flight is expected to be in 2023. There were also a few uh, special purpose scientific flights carrying X-ray telescopes and cosmic ray detectors in, in at the primary, you know, in the primary payload module um, instead of the cameras. Um, I don't know how many of those there were, but anyway, let's rewind and go back to look at Zenit 4. Now, this was the high resolution version of the Zenit, equipped with cameras that had a focal length of three meters giving resolutions of about three to five meters on the ground. This long focal length meant that the optical path was actually longer than the satellite, so they had some mirrors in there to fold it up and make sure that it would work. It was also quite a bit heavier than the Zenit 2, so it needed the larger launch vehicle used for the Voskhod. Uh, the baseline version of the Zenit 4 launched 72 times from 1963 until 1970. The Zenit 4M rotor and the later 4MK Germes and 4MKS Garakel were a somewhat significant evolution from the original design, being equipped with solar panels to extend their life on orbit and a restartable engine in a conical structure on the front of the vehicle. The engine would allow changes to the orbit timing, which would allow them to tune passes over important targets. These also demonstrated the ability to make low altitude passes over targets to improve image resolution. Using the maneuvering engine, they would dip down to perigees of 170 kilometers. There's also some sources that suggest that to do this, the vehicle had to be equipped with uh, aerodynamic surfaces that would prevent the tenuous atmosphere from pushing the spacecraft out of alignment and uh, shrouds to protect the optics from atmospheric heating. It's not clear what the differences might be between these three variants. I mean, presumably there are evolutions in camera hardware, but we do know that the 4MKM switched over to the Soyuz for its launch vehicle. Between them, these three variants flew 173 times from 1968 to 1980. And then we have the slightly more civilian versions, the Zenit 4MT Orion and the 4MKT Fram. These were designed for topographic imaging so that they could create maps. So in addition to the cameras, they also carried things like laser altimeters and other instrumentation, and they would typically fly at higher inclinations to cover more of the Earth. While they still used the generic Cosmos de uh, designation, some of these flights were announced as performing surveys of Earth resources and you know that kind of thing. Of course, there's still plenty of military value in having really good maps. So the Zenit MT flew 23 times from 1971 to 82, and the MKT was 27 flights from 1975 to 1985. 
Meanwhile, the proper spy satellite work continued with the Zenit 4 and the Zenit 8, which presumably had the latest in film technology and continued their reconnaissance operation over 194 flights from 1976 to 1994. The film-based uh, satellite would be superseded by the Yantar satellites, which initially used small film return capsules, but later introduced electro-optical imaging in 1982. For comparison, the US reconnaissance satellite program flew its first KH-11 electro-optical satellite in 1976, and the last film return cam uh, spacecraft, the Hexagon, in 1984. But the Zenit design also had a career in scientific Earth imaging. There was the resource F1, F2 and F1M satellites, which were focused on Earth resource uh, imagery using various combinations of multispectral film and filters. So these began flying in 1979 and over the next 20 years there would be 64 flights. There's one particular mission that stands out. It's 1992 uh, resource 500 Zvezda Columbia which, while it used the resource name, it carried no cameras and instead carried a cargo of messages to the American people and promotional materials for the Russian space program. It was a commercial mission timed to coincide with the 500th anniversary of Christopher Columbus arriving in the Americas. Unlike all of the other flights, the descent capsule was aimed to splash down in the eastern Pacific Ocean so it could be recovered and brought to the US. This was part of a campaign to promote commercial use of Russian space capabilities. So this is a spacecraft that dates back to the 1950s, and while most people see that Vostok had a short life, the design continued being used up until the 21st century as a spacecraft able to keep its payloads stable and secure in orbit and then return them to Earth. It flew as a spy satellite over 650 times. And if we add in the Vostok, Resource, Bion, Photon, and other variants, it's probably about 750 flights of the design. Only recently has Starlink surpassed this count, but Starlink satellites are small and dozens are launched on each Falcon 9. Vostok, Zenit, and their descendants are launched one at a time on a single launch vehicle devoted to each spacecraft. Each of them is five or six tons. And of course, the number of landings and recoveries may not be surpassed for a very long time. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.